I'm gonna tell you a fact that blew my mind when I first learned it. You can take a continuous signal, sample it, and if one condition is met, you can reconstruct the signal perfectly, like an infinite connect the dots game. This sounds impossible. For every point we sample, there's an infinite number of points we completely ignore. Common sense tells us that almost all information would be lost in the process. There's infinitely many ways to connect the dots, so how could we know the exact signal the points were sampled from? In 1949, Claude Shannon and Harry Nyquist have proven that when sampling a signal, if the sampling frequency is higher than twice the maximum frequency of the signal, the original signal is completely recoverable from its samples. The reconstructed signal is then given by this formula, where x of n is the sampled signal, t is the sampling period, and the sync function is defined by sine of x over x. But this raises more questions. What do we mean by the maximum frequency of a signal? What does the sync function have to do with anything here? And how is this condition sufficient for magically connecting the dots? The math in this video relies on the Fourier series and the Fourier transform. I am going to explain them briefly, but if you don't know what any of those are, I highly recommend you watch 3Blue and Brown's videos about them. When analyzing signals, it is often more useful to look at the signal's frequency than its intensity over time. Let's take a look at the cosine wave. To describe its intensity over time, you would have to know its value at every point in time over one period. That's a lot considering you only need two numbers to describe it, amplitude and frequency. And as proven by French mathematician Joseph Fourier, every periodic function can be expressed as a sum of sine and cosine waves whose frequencies are integer multiples of the function's base frequency. For example, a square wave with a frequency of 1, which is a period of 2 pi, can be expressed as this sum. And the periodic extension of f of x equals x can be expressed as such. If the function is not periodic, you can think about it as a periodic function where the period time approaches infinity, or the frequency approaches zero. In this case, the discrete sum turns into an integral, and the discrete coefficients turn into a function. This limit is called the Fourier transform. To put it shortly, the Fourier transform at a certain frequency measures how much does the function overlap with cosines and sines of said frequency. Doing so for all frequencies will give us a new function of omega. As we said, the Fourier transform measures overlaps with sines and cosines, so what happens when we feed it, let's say, a pure cosine wave? You can see that as we increase our bounds of integration, the transform approaches zero everywhere, except for two spikes at plus and minus one, where the transform approaches one. Actually, I scaled down the transform so it would fit in the screen. Here's what it really looks like. It approaches zero everywhere, except for two spikes in plus and minus one, where the area under the spikes approaches one. But if the area approaches one, while the width approaches zero, this must mean that the height is approaching infinity. This type of spike has a special name, Dirac's delta function. It has many uses in physics and engineering, and it's going to help us a lot later. The delta function has a very special property. Integrating delta of x minus a multiplied by some function f of x will give us f of a. This is because the integrand is equal to zero anywhere except x equals a, so we can throw out f of a as a constant. We're left with the integral of the delta function, which, as I mentioned, is equal to one. Let's say we want to analyze the frequencies of some signal. 
The Fourier transform can be calculated in our computer, but the computer only has access to the sampled signal. What do we do now? The Fourier transform only works on functions, but the sample signal is not. What we can do is to multiply each sample by a delta function, so we would get an expression whose ft is defined. Because the delta function equals zero anywhere else, that's equivalent to multiplying the original signal by this delta sequence, also called an impulse train. And because of another important piece of information, we can now find the ft fairly easily. An impulse train with period t can be expressed as this sum. Let's substitute omega s for 2 pi over t. Multiplying by the signal will give us this sum. Luckily, we have a formula for the Fourier transform of a function multiplied by a cosine. It is two copies of the original transform, centered around plus and minus omega s. Doing so for the entire sum will give us a periodic extension of the original Fourier transform with a period of omega s. So there we have it. This is the ft of a discrete signal. Using a little bit of algebra, we can get a formula for the transform using only the sampled signal. Let's start by subbing in the original definition for the impulse train, and swap the sum in the integral. Then, using the delta function's special property, the integral will cancel out, leaving us with this. Let's denote x of nt as x of n with square brackets. We will now get our final result which is, in fact, the definition for the FT of discrete time signals, often called DTFT. Now we have everything we need to try and recover the signal. First, let's sample it and then calculate its DTFT. We will get the original FT cloned over and over again. There's the original copy of the FT, and clone centers around omega equals n times omega s for all integers n. Notice how when we increase the sampling frequency, the clones get further and further apart. We can try to filter out the high frequencies, and then hopefully be left with our original FT, which we can then use to recover the signal. That's definitely a step in the right direction, but there are two big problems with this approach. When we add all the clones together, they overlap with each other, so each clone contributes a little more height to the original copy. For almost all signals, those contributions will become smaller as we increase the sampling rate, but for many signals, they will never completely disappear, no matter how fast we sample. This means that a high sampling rate might give us an approximation for the original signal, but we wouldn't be able to perfectly recover it. The second problem comes from the shape of the original FT. You can see that each clone is made of a main bulge in the center and thinner tails at the sides. Filtering out the high frequencies might remove most of the problems that the clones create, but it would also trim the tails of the original copy which would make perfect reconstruction impossible. See that even without the clones, trimming the tails to close will result in recovering a completely different signal. But if both of these problems are caused by the tails, we can get rid of the problems if we get rid of the tails. If we require that the signal's FT won't have a tail, which means that there exists some frequency, omega max, so the ft equals zero for all frequencies greater than omega max, those two fundamental problems disappear. Signals that satisfy this condition are called band-limited signals, and the ability to recover them depends only on the sample rate. If we require the signal to be band-limited and sample the signal fast enough, the clones will completely separate, solving our first problem. We could then filter the high frequencies and remove all the clones without affecting our original copy, and thus solving our second problem. For the clones to separate, we need the original copy to start after the clone to its left end, and for it to end before the clone to its right starts. The original copy is centered at omega equals zero, and so it ends at omega equals omega max. The clone to its right is centered around omega equals omega s, 
and so it starts at omega s minus omega max. If we require that omega end is smaller than omega start and rearrange, we will get our final condition. And this is exactly Nyquist and Shannon's theorem from the beginning of the video. We can go even further than this and find a formula for the reconstructed signal. We first take the Fourier transform of our sampled signal and then multiply it by a window function which is going to filter out the high frequencies. We can now use the inverse Fourier transform to get our original signal. Substituting x of omega will give us this. Now we can swap the order of integration and summation to get this. And now all we have to do is to solve the integral. Plugging in this result will give us our final formula. And that's it! We have found a formula to connect the dots! We have now shown how is this possible, but it still doesn't answer why. Why is this possible? What I think is beautiful about this piece of math is how it comes as a direct result from the mere existence of Fourier series. Joseph Fourier proved that in order to describe a continuous function in a finite segment of time, you only need discrete coefficients in the frequency domain, which means that every function is uniquely described by its Fourier coefficients. What we've done here is using this proof in the opposite direction. We've shown that every function of frequencies in a finite segment of frequencies, which is the Fourier transform, is uniquely described by discrete coefficients in the time domain, which is the sampled signal. When I learned about this subject in university, the professor only briefly mentioned it, and he had a very good reason for it. While mathematically true, such a system is impossible to construct in the physical world. Why? Well, let's take a look at the formula again. We add up infinitely many sync functions whose height depends on the sample they correspond with. So at time t equals zero, we need to add all the sync functions that depend on the past values of the signal, but also on the future values of it. We can't predict the future yet, so for now it will remain only in theory. In practice, you can approximate this reconstruction in a way you wouldn't depend on the future at all. I've left an interactive tool for you to compare different approximations and to test Nyquist's condition, which leads me to my final question for you. This formula works only for signals that satisfy Nyquist's condition. So what happens if we use it on a signal that doesn't? 